Thank you to record, please, Alex. Perfect. Again, welcome everyone. Mirla and I are honored to be with you and to share a little taste of some of the overlapping Torah of Musar and psychology. Musar in a nutshell is the Jewish strand of ethical meets spiritual practice where Torah is still central um, and, and tradition is every bit as important as it is in any other wing of this beautiful Jewish experience, but front and center are questions not only of ethics and responsibility, but of what kind of people are we training ourselves to be, not only in the life of the mind by studying another page of Talmud, but by studying ourselves, our actions, our proclivities. Um, so it's, it's embodied and it is holistic, it is other directed even as we start with ourselves. Um, and th this overlap, even though the antecedents of modern Musar go back many millennia actually, uh, some of the important texts were around 1100, um, and it picked up a form that some of us might recognize in the 19th century in Eastern European yeshivot that had this as a focus alongside Talmud study. Um, and all of that is, of course, before the modern social sciences, before Freud or Jung, um, or certainly Skinner, even though there's a certain cognitive behavioralist bias in the approach of Musar. Um, we're going to look at the many points where this approach of Torah and the insights of modern psychology help advance the sacred work that we are called to do, um, work that is about climate, but climate touches everything, and this work is about everything as well. Just want to note that uh, we're going to talk a lot about midot, which are the particular attributes that each of us have and focus on. There's many lists, and on some, the four that we've sung, ahava, love, rachamim, compassion, chesed, a divine level of loving kindness, and shalom, which is, of course, peace, but also wholeness, um, integrity. Um, those are potentially among the midot. They're certainly values. Um, and um, we, we are looking in to figure out the work that we each do um, as these unfold. Musar practice includes things like chanting, and it includes journaling, and it includes side conversations. There's so much more. Please immerse yourself if you're not familiar. This is not meant to be Musar 101, but just to understand that starting with chant and revisiting um, how we're feeling in our bodies, what's coming up for us in our souls and our memories um, as the conversation unfolds, that is all Musar practice. Mirla. Thank you. So when climate change first came on the scene, it was seen as a problem of chemistry, of physics, of engineering. But more and more, uh, we're turning to the human sciences to understand it because climate change is not a technical problem, but at bottom, it's a problem of human behavior and human decision-making. And we need changes in human behavior and we need social change in order to address it and to uh, adopt the solutions that are needed. So scientists have been exploring questions of how do people change and how can we apply those insights to this problem? The metaphor that I uh, find the most helpful, uh, I first read in a book by Jonathan Haidt uh, called The Happiness Hypothesis. And in that book, um, he actually has a photo. If I'd been more organized, I would have prepared the photo for you. But if you could just imagine in your mind, a picture of an elephant, a beautiful elephant with a trainer riding on top of the elephant. And Jonathan's metaphor is that our conscious mind is the trainer and all the rest of us is the elephant. The elephant is our guts, it's our emotions, it's our instincts. And what he teaches us is that decision-making is not a rational process, but it's a process that takes place in the elephant, in the body of the elephant. 
that we make our decisions by guts and emotion. And what he says is, just think about an elephant and the trainer and think if your mind wants to go one way, but your guts and your emotion wanna go the other way. So if the trainer wants to go one way, but the elephant wants to go the other way, which way are you going to go? Obviously the elephant is a lot bigger and a lot more powerful and will carry the cognitive mind with it. And just think about things that you've wanted to do that you knew you should do like dieting or giving up smoking or exercising or perhaps making some changes in the way your um, funds are invested because you're interested in divesting from fossil fuels. Or I used to use the example of my husband who I wanted to get to compost, but he didn't like the idea of carrying our garbage on the subway. That was an emotion. So he couldn't get himself to do it. So the real challenge is how do we get the attention of the elephant to make those decisions that we need to make? How do we engage those parts of us, the guts, the emotions, the instincts? And that's why we decided to start our program today with a song, because that is one of the ways that we can engage the emotional side of ourselves. So a little bit later, we're gonna talk about some of our tools for doing that, but we wanted to invite you to ask any questions that you already have. Perhaps you could put them uh, in the mm -hmm. chat um, and we can start to respond to some of your questions and your interests. Okay, I'm in. As you have a chance to okay. ask, and with appreciation again to Vicky, our friend and Zoom Gabai, as the kind of uh, moderator to help us stay on that, um, just so that you know, um, over the course of the program, uh, the first hour with uh, Mirala and then uh, continuing to 2.15, uh, we both have a lot, uh, we all have a lot going on today, but um, hope you can stay. Um, Part two is going to be hope. We're going to turn to questions of hope and tikva next um, and, uh, and explore a bit around that and then around the larger questions of framing. What actually moves people toward meaningful climate change for themselves? Again, changing from within as Rabbi David Jaffe writes about and has taught about and as we have titled this session as well. Um, and then the last uh, 15 or 20 minutes will be a deeper dive into the traditional categories of Musar and the Midot with an eye to eco and climate applicability. So first round of questions. And perhaps you could put some thoughts into the chat mm -hmm. about when your emotions, your guts, your instincts have been engaged by the climate crisis. What, what made you feel that this is something that you wanted to get involved in? So as people are um, making your contributions, uh, let me tell you a story. So a few years ago, I was invited to speak to a group of teenagers at the Jewish Theological Seminary. They had come to New York for a two week program on social justice in New York City. And uh, I was asked to give them an environmental justice tour. So we walked some of the streets of Harlem and we saw some of the industrial facilities that are polluting the air there. The, uh, in particular, I remember we visited a bus depot where hundreds of buses that traveled all over the city, you know, were, 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 <laughs> Were, were parked, but I spent a lot of time idling and polluting the air there. And then we made our way to the North River Waste Treatment Plant, uh, which is a sewage treatment plant for Manhattan, which was um, imposed on the city, uh, in, well, imposed on the neighborhood. It was supposed to be built in lower Manhattan, uh, but in a closed room meeting, the decision was made to move it to Harlem where the burden would be placed on the African-American community. But as we stood there on the uh, roof of this uh, plant and talked about um, some of the impacts on the Hudson River, I told the teens about the fact that it used to be that the Hudson was so polluted that you couldn't swim in it and that there were very, very few fish. 
So many uh, cities and towns were disposing their sewage in there, as well as industrial effluent was going into the river. But that after 19, around 1966, things began to change. There was a fishermen's association that came into being to protect the fish. And they were able to use some old laws that no one had ever used before to uh, sue the companies that were disposing their waste into the river. And then Pete Seeger, many of you will remember fondly, started to sing about the Hudson River. And he got people together and they built a sailing ship called the Clearwater. And they used that to educate people and engage people in advocacy for the Hudson River. And then the federal government passed the Clean Water Law and cities had to start cleaning up their waste stream. And today, the Hudson I, River yeah, is I, I have. Really clean enough to swim in. And 200, over 200 species of fish are living in the river. Well, when the program was over, I asked the teens, what did they learn? What did they get out of our morning together? And what they said was really surprising to me and really profound. They said they learned that things could get better. They said, no one ever tells us that things get better. We hear all about the problems, but we don't hear about people getting together and fixing the problems and things actually getting better. They felt hopeful from that one story that I told them. You know, we're all responsible for climate change and that brings up a lot of feelings of guilt and anxiety. And guilt and anxiety lead to denial. And that's part of the reason that I'm sure all of you have been talking to people about climate change and they don't always wanna hear about it. They don't wanna hear what they have to do. There's a great book that I recommend called Don't Even Think About It. It's by George Marshall. And he basically spends a whole book explaining all the reasons why people don't want to hear about climate change. But what scientists have learned is that the way we can overcome that is to engage positive emotions. Emotions like hope, which I just explained in that story. Emotions like pride, pride in what our communities can do. Love of our children, our grandchildren. All of these things help to people to overcome those feelings of guilt and anxiety. And it's really important to have a positive vision of the future, to understand what the benefits will be of addressing climate change. That will be healthier has been found to be one of the most powerful motivators. That jobs, that people will have stronger communities, that we can build in equity, something that we value. Well, as a Jewish activist, I feel that Jewish history and belief in faith in the future, which is you know, such an intrinsic part of Judaism, our belief that the world can be perfected, that it will be perfected in the future, is one way of taking these psychological insights and spreading them to our communities and help giving us the power to change the world. So perhaps in the chat, you could put some suggestions about what gives you hope Maybe we can share some of that hope with each other. And while you're doing that, I think we're going to sing some yeah. more. Yeah. Even before that, uh, just responding to the previous prompt, some beautiful perspectives on simply seeing the beauty of the world and being touched by it. But I especially appreciated those who described a personal aha moment that began with self and with our own world, perhaps the violets in our own garden, and then goes across the world to thinking about people in, who uh, in hard scrabble subsistence agriculture and how much more vulnerable they are to droughts than we are. Um, and that idea of, of starting with self and then going to other, that is of course, the, the larger frame for all of this. Um, Hillel said long before there was talk of a Musar movement that we have to balance, of course, im in anili mili. If I am not for myself, who will be for me? We start with ourselves, existentialism. Um, there is a certain self preservation baked into the nature of life and we, we celebrate that and we work with that, but we do not let it be totalizing. And Hillel beautifully changes, uh, kind of ups the moral ante in the equivalent with part two of this famous line, ma'ani." 
But if I am just, is implied, if I am only for myself, what am I? I'm not even human if I simply stay in that self-absorbed place. And that is part of this, this work. Psychology speaks to the individual, to the psyche, but it's ultimately about being better in relationship. Musar speaks to internal midot, but it's ultimately about following the mitzvot that point us beyond to humanity, to creation, and to the one. Um, and so this dance of inner and outer is exactly what we're getting to, and many people have had aha moments along that line. Um, also, from the previous prompt, there was a lot of questions about how we move others. And again, it's that dance. We have to move ourselves and make sure that we've done the internal check, that we're moving as we should, and yes, motivating others. And we're going to get there in just a few minutes in the next round of slides. Let me just chime in also um, on a couple of the comments here. I noticed that people talked about things that they saw, photos and videos. Just to say that we know that people respond to visual images. Um, I'm sure you've heard the old saying, a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, that's, <laughs> that's known from research as well. And uh, sharing photos, both of, um, you know, so I think some people mentioned seeing the damage caused by climate change can be very powerful, but seeing images of positive uh, change, seeing images of people, especially taking action, is also extremely um, motivating to people. Um, I also noticed someone gave a comment about that they, they talked about their children suffering. Um, again, that's those kind of emotions, being able to relate to other people who are uh, either suffering from the impacts of climate change. I'm sure we all remember the photos of the hurricanes and the wildfires, um, but also seeing people, again, taking action is very powerful. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So as we focus on hope, and again, an invitation through this whole next unit to keep putting your sources of hope into the chat, as well as questions, I can't promise we'll be able to follow all of them as we go. Um, wanted to return us to every few minutes to song um, and then a little exploration of hope through the lens of Midot. Prefiguring when we deep uh, dive into the Midot, each of these, what would it look like to focus on Ahava, on love, which begins as an ethereal emotion but ends up being an internal commander of us, of actions that we must take in order to actually live out that love. What would it look like to center rachamim, literally from rechem, womb, that kind of, of, of almost biological compassion when something else is directly connected to you even though it is outside of you? What would it look like to develop that sense of connection with marginalized communities who bear the greatest brunt of climate impact? What would that look like for uh, compassion, this radical love for the species that are on the brink that the next choices of legislation or corporate action may make the difference of whether they have enough habitat to survive or not? The same for every one of these Midot. They are amazing resources for climate activism and all of the other questions that swirl around them. In terms of hope, of course, Tikva, uh, as in Ha Tikva, the Israeli national anthem, speaks to what a long shot 
it was to return to sovereignty after almost two millennia. We are people who hold out long shot odds and we need to remember that against all of the climate despair uh, that is so easily out there. Uh, we saw a, a counselor or therapist having written in a third of their clients with um, adolescence and very often framing climate despair as an existential question um, about life. And we're seeing that more and more. So how do we center hope? How do we hold the reality of the science that is plenty daunting and the reality of the, the hurdles against the level, the scale of collective action that is needed to turn this juggernaut around in time for individuals, for societies, for low-lying cities, for um, species. Um, these are very real questions. I'm going to introduce five very quickly that lead us into the question of climate communications and framing, um, which will be the biggest part of part three. But again, keep amplifying your own sources of hope. So one drawn from Musar is the idea of cognitive dissonance that outside of a handful of people who genuinely reject science, most people know there is a gap between what they know to be true or likely or at least possible and the scale of their own actions. And I would submit that is very much the case for most good Jewish liberals, <laughs> even those who attend the big bold Jewish climate fest, that we may have higher than average awareness of just how bad the problem is, and yet we are still living more like our neighbors, because that's very human, as opposed to more like we can only use one 7.5 billionth of the world's collective carbon, and anything over that is inherently immoral. Bechira is choice, and in Musar, we speak a lot about Bechira points. What are those moments when you have a decision? It maybe I'm starting to eat lower on the food chain because I know the impact of the meat industry. I'm not yet vegetarian, but what I order for lunch today, that is a Bechira point. Maybe I often walk or bike or take public transit when it's not COVID, um, but I also often drive my car. Which one? That's the Bechira point. As we shift in our maturity, maybe it becomes, I really want to take that vacation at the end of COVID. I have the resources to buy the airplane ticket and see a beloved or go to a place I've wanted to be. And yet that carbon footprint has to be part of the question, not just is it worth X number of dollars. Those are Bechira points. And it gives me hope that we grow and that the front where those choice points lie keeps shifting, hopefully in an ever more moral direction. Second, the idea of digital versus analog. Too many times we hear we have X number of years. We even hear that from scientists. It's not that simple because of course, um, it's digital life or death for an individual, for a city, for an ecosystem, for a species. But at a collective level, there will always be more imperiled, um, but we can make a difference. Maybe not for the next three, but for the ones after that, because a certain amount of destruction has already been logged in. This is kind of a policy wonky and wan form of hope, but it's very real we can still save. John Holdren was President Obama's science advisor, and he talked about this idea of mitigation, adaptation, and suffering. We've already locked in all three. The question is ratios. The more we work on reducing our carbon and methane and other greenhouse gas equivalent impacts now, the less adaptation will be required and the less suffering will happen. Since the carbon footprint is still rising. We need to focus on adaptation, especially for more marginal communities that don't have the resources and did less to create the crisis. And still there will be suffering. Where we are insufficient on either mitigation or adaptation, the suffering grows, which means there's still something we can do about it. That relates to another source of hope for me is how quickly, comparatively, racial justice and climate justice have become in the larger consciousness of the movement and the world 
increasingly intertwined. For far too long, it was an effete, disproportionately white, often with uh, very severe social and racial and economic blinders on. Um, and we all still have our blinders, but at least there's a collective commitment in the movement to calling ourselves on the entrenched racism and making change. Climate communications, the breakthroughs that are possible when we actually figure out what are the right messages. And finally, us. It is the faces on this Zoom and throughout the Big Bold Jewish Climate Fest that certainly give me hope, disproportionately youth-led and especially multi-faith. I want to call out groups like interfaithpowerandlight.org and the many other wonderful groups, Green Faith and local efforts and um, the National Religious Partnership for the Environment. There's so much that we can do together, as well as individually as Jews through the many wonderful organizations, dayenu.org, Chazon, Jewish Earth Alliance, Kojal. Um, I, I, I fear naming because I'm going to leave out the Shalom Center, um, the Urban Adama, the, the list goes on. Um, there's so much good stuff happening. Uh, Dr. Anthony Lazarowitz at Yale um, is one of the great experts on this. Uh, the questions of climate framing, what actually works to make change? And a lot of the message boils down to simplicity. Uh, we who are deep in the weeds can easily lose people with that um, up front. There's also a question of how much doom and gloom we should even center, um, because some of that can be counterproductive. Bottom line, scientists agree, it's real, it's us, it's bad, but there's hope. So not only is hope the last word of the summary of kind of what good climate change communication looks like, um, it gives me hope that we have the empirical data that it, this stuff works. And the final piece, as folks were asking about how we move people, um, the, Yale and others have been doing this for a very long time, um, talk about these sort of six Americas, and we just got to an amazing record tipping point when the top two categories, those who are alarmed, which is uh, climate activists and those who are concerned, who will prioritize this in their voting and their consuming habits, have already reached a majority of Americans. Um, we will, it will be a very long time before we ever get the doubtful or the dismissive, but notice that is less than 20% of the population or the electorate, way down from historic highs. So we are reaching a tipping point. We have the possibility of building on this and making change. Um, and we have some amazing young leaders to help with that shift. This is grounds for hope. And maybe we can read into the record anything that's come up in the chat, Vicki, perhaps, um, that are other grounds for hope that we should consider before we sing again. Uh, Ju Julie would like to speak. Do you see? Great. Um, you can I think you, you, you may. Okay, great. Um, I, I don't, I can ask you to unmute, Julie. But yeah, I think, I think you may have to with the setting. Um, I see Hannah Joy is an act of resistance. I see Stephen taking part in like with like-minded people in Extinction Rebellion, um, rolling up sleeves as a source of hope together, um, using art as activism as a source of hope. Some beautiful, beautiful comments. Learning early on not to be silent and not to be a bystander. Elders uniting. For action. And just witnessing the regenerative power of nature when we back off, there are places where we have actively reversed the damage, not enough yet, but a growing number. Nice. Let's keep thinking about hope. And then we'll sing, and then we'll delve a bit more into the psychology side of how change happens. 
um, if for the next 20 minutes or so, and after the final 20 minutes or so, delving deeper into the Musar resources, focusing on Midot as a means of uh, changing ourselves and changing the world. Okay, I wanted to just point out that singing is actually a Musser technique. Fred, you need to emphasize that everybody should sing along because that singing engages those positive emotions, those feelings of commitment. So now I'd like you to imagine a, an old fashioned university um, fitness center. And in there, there's one of those shower rooms. I don't think they still have those, but one big shower room where all the guys would take a shower together. You picturing it in your mind? So professors Elliot Aronson and Michael O'Leary did an experiment in the shower room at the University of California, Santa Barbara. In that shower room, there was a sign that was encouraging people to save water, reduce their water consumption. And the sign said, wet down, so turn the water on and get wet, turn the water off, water off, soap up, and then rinse off. So turn the water back on. So they wanted people to turn the water off while they were soaping up. Now, unfortunately, most people did not uh, actually follow the instructions on the sign. You can guess to yourself what the proportion was of people who followed the instructions. Maybe you want to put it in the chat. Anybody want to guess? Anyone quick on the chat? 2% says Leah. That's close. 10%. Okay, it was in between. It was 6% of people. Not very many. You got the idea. So they designed an experiment to see if they could get the guys coming into the shower to save water. And the way the experiment went was the following. They put what they called an accomplice, someone in cahoots with the experimenters in the shower. And when a student would enter the shower, well, the accomplice would turn on the water. And then when a student would enter the shower, the accomplice would turn off the water and follow the recommended water saving procedure. Now, what do you think happened then? Anyone want to guess? What percentage of the students actually turned off the water and started saving water? Many more. Yes, someone put in. 75%, 98%, well, it wasn't quite that good, 48%, who said that? Sarah Rosen. It was actually 49% who followed along and did that procedure just because they saw somebody else doing it. And then they upped the ante. They actually put two accomplices in the shower. And when they put two accomplices in the shower, 67%, almost three quarters of the people actually would turn off the water and save water. I love this shower, this story because the image is just so memorable. The people in the shower, right, watching each other. But this study demonstrates a very, very important psychological principle, which is social norms. In fact, most of what we do in life, we do because we see other people doing it. Just think of all of our regular everyday behavior. You know, when you go to the grocery store, you stand in line to pay, you know. <laughs> Just think of so many different things, you know. It, it, this is the way we live our lives. Most of what we do, we do because the people around us are doing it. So we can apply this principle to get people to make better decisions about 
climate change and about our own behavior. And the key challenge that we face is actually making these new social norms visible. You know, you notice I had to explain to you that it was this old fashioned shower room where everyone could see how other people were taking a shower. Most of the things we, you know, many things that we do that are good for the environment really aren't that visible to others. We've been applying this lever of social change in, in our congregation where Rabbi Fred is my incredibly inspiring leader. We have a climate action team and we've been able to use this power of activating social norms to do things like get people to sign up for community solar, to buy their electricity from a community solar field, and even to stop the fossil fuel money pipeline by signing up for a green socially responsible credit card to take our business away from the big banks that are financing um, uh, social fossil fuel infrastructure. Now this kind of change can really add up because of social network effects. So think about how we change the norms in this country about smoking. I'm sure many of you have memories about, you know, when all of a sudden you realize that it just was not cool, you know, for people to be smoking in a movie theater or in a, um, in a bar, you know, or now it's even on the street, right? That was a, we changed the norm from everybody smoking. You know, we saw the people smoking in the movie, you know, on the movie screen, all the actors smoked and everything to a point where it's really socially unacceptable to smoke. And there, scientists have demonstrated that one of the biggest factors, if not the biggest factor as to whether people take up smoking is how many people in their social network are smokers. And now they've actually demonstrated this effect with putting solar panels on your roof. When one person in the neighborhood puts solar panels on their roof, that starts a positive network effect. And other people in the neighborhood are more likely to do the same. Sometimes this is called the social contagion effect. Now that we're all so familiar with the dynamics of epidemics, we can really appreciate how this kind of change can reach a tipping point where things go out of control but in this case, in a positive way. Now we need change on an individual level, on a community level, and on a systemic level. All of these types of change are connected because when people change individually, it actually changes others through that social network effect. And it also changes them or it changes us individually. Researchers have found that when we make a change in our personal behavior, we're more willing to get involved in changing things on a systemic level. So we're more willing to get involved in talking to others, so changing that social norm, and getting involved in advocacy. And I really recommend a recent book called Under the Influence, Putting Peer Pressure to Work, Putting Peer Pressure to Work by Robert Frank. He's a behavioral economic, economic I'm sorry, he's a behavioral economist. And that book really explains how these levels of change are connected and how the social network effect and the tipping point can get us to the point where we solve the climate crisis. But I just wanna emphasize, because here we're at the big bold Jewish climate fest, that community, that level of community change is absolutely key. It's the in-between, between the personal individual change and the systemic change. I've learned a lot about how we can get our community, use that community effect to get change uh, from an approach called community-based social marketing. I hope you're all taking notes of all these references. Fred said I should definitely give references so you could follow up. <laughs> community-based social marketing. The name of the book is Fostering Sustainable Behavior and it's by Doug McKenzie Moore, where he talks about the techniques that we can use, specific techniques to get people to change their behavior. And he points out that all behavior change initiatives are most effective when they're carried out at the community level and involve direct contact with people. Researchers are pretty convinced that those advertisements on TV are not what change people's behavior. It's the face-to-face -face changing of social norms that makes a difference. And that's where our Jewish communities can be so, so powerful. We can use those techniques that Fred is talking about from Musar to change ourselves 
and then it will become contagious to the people around us and our community actions can really add up. Nice. There was a, a beautiful request from Madeline uh, for a list of resources. I don't know if you could type them in the chat while I screen share briefly. We're going to have a moment of conversation here. Um, and then um, Mirla has another climate and interfaith thing to uh, go to. So we're going to turn to Musar shortly after that. Um, as she puts that list together, I just want to share a cartoon and a midah that I think will uh, speak volumes, uh, amplifying what uh, she just said. I'm indebted to Rabbi Shoshana Meira Friedman of Boston and uh, Dayenu for uh, the source. This is about a year and a half old. Um, many of us are still in the 80s, 90s mode when we first learned about the environment and we thought we could teach our children well, pick up your litter and save the earth. And then it got a little more complicated. Recycle and you can save the earth. And then it got a little more impactful. Change your transportation habits, change your diet, reduce your carbon footprint and you can save the earth. And only in recent years have we come to realize the real message is, and if you can read it, let, let's do a, uh, like we're in synagogue, a responsive reading. What do we now need to tell our children? Please read together completely restructure global economic systems, and you may be able to save a remnant of humanity. Changing ourselves to change the climate. Our unchanged selves are changing the climate for the worse. We can change it for the better. And we can only do that by addressing the interconnected crises that include structural racism and poverty and perennial disempowerment of sizable blocks of humanity, as well as figuring out ways to give the non-human biosphere more of a voice as well. And one name for that in the language of Musar is achrayut, responsibility, which is from the root of acher, the other. And the challenge we always have in every great moral and spiritual practice is to figure out how to center the other more in our own consciousness, in our own decision-making. So achrayut, when we recognize the other, we recognize how responsible we are for them, how interconnected we all are. So some beautiful resources now in the chat and another round of questions and amplifications, particularly on the the um, psychology side while we still have Mirala. I see there was a comment about um, putting solar panels on your house and uh, um, finding out that not many houses are actually uh, appropriate for uh, solar panels. I don't like to talk about solar panels too much for my examples because that's true. Only about 25% of homes are appropriate for solar panels. But there are lots of other ways that people can support renewable energy, such as community solar. I think I mentioned that our congregation supports a community solar field. Um, someone also talked about being disappointed that other people didn't follow their example. I'm sure you've talked about it uh, with your neighbors. Um, and invited them to take a look um, and learn about how you did it. But one of the ways that's very successful in getting people to adopt solar panels is through a co-op. And that really just has to do with building a community. Doing it together is much more effective than doing it individually. More people will participate. Uh, but it also made me think about a very another very important point, which is um, the research shows that I think somewhat like a maybe a quarter of people uh, actually talk about climate change on a regular basis. So one of the most effective things that we can do as individuals is to talk with other people about climate change and about what we're doing, um, all the activism or the personal steps that we're taking, because that's one of the ways that we make that new social norm visible. If people see that people around them are talking about it and are concerned about it and taking action, that's how that social contagion gets going.
Nice. Interesting uh, side conversation in the chat about um, how the, the last panel of the comic uh, ended up about humanity. It's back to this idea of starting with ourselves, but not ending with ourselves. Can we find that point of enlightened self-interest? And when it comes to the field of climate communications and trying to actually get the skeptics, the doubters, the disengaged, the people further to the right on that uh, Yale uh, graph that I showed earlier, um, how might we actually engage them? Um, it doesn't start with what we want to say. We may want to talk about uh, 414 ppm uh, and, and we may want to start with talking about the science being settled. Those are important but they are not ultimately going to move them. In fact, if anything, they're going to flow into the already patterned information of silos, and that goes in the into the debatable. I've heard that before. I've already rejected it. What are you saying that's different? So we talk in terms of public health. We talk in terms of our our children and our children's children. We talk in terms of the weird winters that we've been having. We talk in terms of um, the, just like that earlier comment, you know, when, when you've seen a drought and the flowers around your front door didn't look as good, right? Now think about subsistence farmers in vulnerable places across the world. Um, we start with self and move to other, and that is a joint insight of Musar and psychology. So, Mirla, in the, your last few minutes with us, what would, what would you like to say that is wrapping up for you? And then we'll have another 15 or 20 minutes together to focus on Midot, please. I guess my final thought would just be uh, just to think about yourself and what moves you and what inspires you and what gets you to actually take action. And although what's true for you won't be true for everyone, you should definitely ask them to <laughs> um, use that as a guide because um, we're all human and uh, those psychological processes uh, are something that we all we all share. So um, take advantage. I'm going to leave it to Fred to share some more about how those Musar practices can move us. But I think the, the, the bottom line is through Judaism, uh, we know we know how to engage those psychological processes of inspiration, of um, the feeling of responsibility, of how to build new habits uh, and new ways of being in the world. We're great with that through our traditions and our rituals. And those things are actually in line with what we're learning now through the research about how to change people's behavior and get them to make better choices and to get together for the social change we need. Amen. Thank you. Um, others have noted how easy it is to save the chat, control A, control C, or use the three dots to save safe chat, and it will appear in your Zoom folder if you have um, it installed. Um, and uh, there's a lot here to treasure that we'll only be able to unpack afterwards. Um, so uh, thank you. This, this is beautiful. Um, good reminders on the the geopolitical reality that the needle is movable in different ways at different times, which is why so much of this is on background, right? I have a friend who's uh, who leads the Environmental and Interfaith Center in Kansas, um, a rabbi. The conversation there is very different than my work with Interfaith Power and Light in Maryland, D.C., and Northern Virginia. Um, what is possible keeps shifting. But what is possible has shifted just in the last couple of years and in a certain way just in the last 10 days um, in some truly remarkable ways. We cannot get complacent, but um, we need to remember that there is possibility in Harrisburg and there is possibility in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, and there is possibility wherever we are. Um, so, uh, and hopefully soon in Washington and around the globe as well. So thank you, Mirla. I'm going to, yeah, thank you. Such an honor and a delight. Um, 
Uh, so Musar, it's interesting how little has been written on eco Musar or or green midos, um, and I'm, we're going to focus in a minute on anava humility, which I I gulp as I say that because I am far from a Musar meister. Um, I am dabbling, as many of us are, um, and there are some who know much more about the literature, are much more experienced practitioners of the daily and the weekly. Um, I see one smiling at me right now. I, uh, and um, and so we need to hold the awareness that we are part of a larger community. And I'm hopefully uh, helping those of us who have some awareness that Musar is a rich vein to tap to uh, help build up this sector. I do believe that it is a key uh, sort of contributor to the Jewish perspective around climate change and a contribution that our pitzel a little community in the annals of humanity might actually make because there's some really good Torah here. So very quickly, again, um, the focus is on individual midot, such as achrayut. How am I at taking and owning responsibility? Do I shirk? Do I jump too quickly to it? How can I be better? How can I pace myself? How can I be appropriately selective about where I go out of my way for that uh, meeting of responsibility? Um, classic text that gives an example of this is from Vayikra Rabbah, um, Shimon Bar Yochai, the famous second century Rav, uh, a parable, people are on a ship, one of them takes out a drill, starts drilling under their spot. And everyone else says, um, what are you doing? And he says, what do you care? It's private property. It's ownership. I paid for my passage for this seat. I'm only doing this beneath my area. The others said to him, of course, <laughs> but you know, we're all in this together. Um, I, uh, some of us heard uh, Rabbi Gordon Tucker of JTS commenting on this just this morning, um, that um, it's easy to dismiss the guy as a fool, but what if he knows something? that is personally advantageous and, and thinks he's doing this for his own long-term benefit, but he is still restricting the value of what could come out of it only to himself. He's willing to impose risk on everyone else for a personal selfish benefit. This is not just idiocy, this is evil. This is anti-Musar. Right? And so achrayut is what does it mean to be conscious of everyone else on the boat? or perhaps in the great metaphor of uh, COVID and climate both, that we are all in the same storm, but we're in different boats. And many of us are on luxury yachts. We have all that we need and plenty of space, and our survival odds are high even in the midst of a challenging storm. Others are in rubber dinghies and rowboats and leaky crafts. We are all in the same storm, but different boats. So achrayut, responsibility, and many of these others, tzedek, justice, call us outward. There's a beautiful teaching in Musar, every midah and its opposite, that we always need to remember that there are values that line up on both sides of the ledger of any meaningful moral equation. We are always doing a balancing act. And sometimes we need to tack in another direction. So one of the great examples of this is one of the core midot is zeal, zirizut, diligence, right? We got to be in it. We got to be passionate. We've got to not let anyone or anything keep us down. And against that is anava, humility, which can be framed as the opposite. This is where I'm not so sure of myself, so maybe I shouldn't go lobby the legislature. What if I'm wrong? That's not the kind of humility that we're talking about. Humility, anava, in Musar is defined as taking up the right amount of space. So think about gender, where women disproportionately are socialized to take up less space, women should take up more. And where men, straight, white, cisgender men like me, are right, raised to take up plenty of space, I should shut up soon and go back to Q&A. Um, because we need to be conscious of taking up the right amount of space. And we need to think about that not only as individual practice, what does it look like for a nation to have anava? 
what percentage of humanity lives in America versus what percentage of the Earth's resources are we using? Or out of the millions of species that comprise this blue boat home of ours, what would it look like to say collective anava? Humanity's collective footprint needs to trim. And that's going to begin disproportionately with the more affluent, the more empowered people, disproportionately including those of us on today's webinar or watching this in the future. We who have extra ability to move the needle have extra obligation to move the needle. We whose investments and choices and practices in recent decades have done the most to drive the climate crisis have extra responsibility to now take up less space. This is a sacred notion uh, drawn from Isaac Luria's 16th century Kabbalah as Tzimtzum. He was answering the question, where is God in a random universe? Um, heavy theological questions about exile and, and dislocation. And the answer is God, in the name of relationship, was willing to take God's self out, for the most part, of an area where God formerly had been. And if God is willing to do that, how much more do we need to self-contract ourselves, right-size ourselves, in the name of relationship? And that is a very powerful notion. It applies in faith terms as well, which is why I keep coming back to interfaith power and light and groups like the Green Faith, in addition to groups like Dayenu and Jewish Earth Alliance and Chazon and Kojal, because um, we need to have that same humility at the inter- uh, faith, multi-faith level. We have some beautiful truths, but so does every other tradition, and we need to be in there together, humbly learning. As with all Musar, there is a heavily theological angle to all this. For example, in Leviticus 25 about Shemitah and Yovel, the vitally important concepts of sabbatical and jubilee, um, which kind of unify uh, economic justice and equality with, with sustainability, with spirituality and community and resilience. God says in Leviticus 25, ki li ha'aretz, the land is mine. Don't go thinking that just because you have a deed registered at the county courthouse that that means anything. If the land is mine, gerim v'toshavim atemi madi, you guys are just visitors, you are temporary dwellers, sojourners. I am the landlord, you are merely the tenants. And of course, the verse that anchors liberation theology, as well as returns the Torah uh, at festivals in our liturgy, Ladonai ha'aretz um lo'o, the earth is God's and the fullness thereof. And that means that it needs to be appropriately and as much as possible equitably distributed divinely distributed the fruits of this one earth that we share. There are so many lists of Midot. You can find a nice one of 60 on the URJ website. Um, Alan Marinus's important book, Everyday Holiness, uh, has chapters on about 20 or 25 different Midot. Um, David Jaffe's beautiful book just uh, goes a deep dive on three. Um, but there are so many lists. This one from 1809, Menachem Mendel of Satanov, um, is one common list that Rabbi Ira Stone, um, of the, um, oh, one of the uh, also leading lights of today's uh, Musar world, um, uh, recommends. And many of these, this is a fairly small slide, so I'm going to eliminate only a handful that are not obviously climate specific. And in slightly larger font, consider just a few of these. What would your eco mido look like, including applying savlanut, patience? Again, every mida on its opposite, righteous indignation, but patience because we're in this for the long haul. Haritsut, decisiveness, act without hesitating once you have deliberated. Once the science is overwhelmingly clear, act in concert with the science. Nikiut, cleanliness. When we read this, it feels almost quaint or antiquated to put that at the top. And yet, what does it mean to simply have an ethic of cleanliness for the area around us? And if everyone followed that in a sort of Kantian way, wouldn't everywhere be clean? 
And can we define invisible pollutants like CO2 and methane to be part of dirt in the sense of cleanliness, clean that stuff up? Again, anava, humility, tzedek, righteousness, kimutz, frugality. We need to watch how we spend down our resources. If we only frame that as bank accounts or 401k plans, we're missing the point, although we need to think about the damage those can do when they're sitting in inappropriate investments or big corporate banks, for sure. But resources, everything around us is a resource. We are not spending them collectively with frugality. And then what's our individual contribution to that with our own purchases? Zerizut, again, zeal or diligence, staying focused on this. But internal nichuta, calmness, or minuchata nefesh, equanimity. Can we sustain ourselves for a struggle that will be lifelong for us and for those that we love without losing the zerizut, the diligence, without taking our eyes off of tzedek, righteousness? But can we develop that calmness and then, of course, emet, truth, the importance of facts to underlie everything. What are your sustainability, sufficiency, midot? How applicable can this be in your practice, in your framing of what keeps you going as a climate activist and related as a racial justice, economic justice um, advocate of all of creation activist? So I'd love to see some answers in the chat to start to formulate that. And um, I'm just gonna do a, a very short dive into a couple of these as you post and the rest of our time is discussion. This is David Jaffe's book titled very similar to our session, Changing the World from the Inside Out. He focuses on kavod among others, the idea of acknowledging the full weight of another. Ben Zoma in Mishnah Avot 1900 years ago asked and answered, Ezehu mechubad, who gets honored? Ha mechabed et ha briot, the one who does the honoring of the creations. It's usually translated as all people, which is itself a very beautiful and important teaching, but it's really from Briah, the same word at the beginning, Bereshit bara Elohim, et ha-shamayim bet So ha is really all of the creations, if you honor all of the creations, the poor and marginal and downtrodden people, as well as those right next to you, the species that are only found under a rock or at the bottom of an ocean, not just the charismatic uh, megafauna, right? then you ultimately become honored only by doing the honoring. And as David uh, Rav Jaffe summarizes, giving kavod, this full acknowledgement of the weight and substance of another, giving kavod is essential to human life. Seeking it for yourself is destructive to both individual and community. But developing a, a lasting sense of self-worth, of ka inner kavod, that is the foundation of sustainable social change. There is some beautiful application of this to climate that has only just begun. Emmet, truth, beginning, middle, and end of the alphabet. The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, which includes facts, which includes 97% of atmospheric scientists, which include IPCC projections that change a little bit every year as new studies are peer-reviewed and new data comes in truth, facts, and of course, love. Whether it's chesed, the divine loving kindness, or in the very direct sense of love your neighbor. And we especially have to combine ahava and kavod and shine some extra love on those corners of our society and our globe that don't receive enough love as it is, proactive kavod, which is why Black Lives Matter is a statement of climate concern. It is a statement of Torah. It is not a social or political slogan. Ahava and rachamim, compassion, and chesed and shalom. We'll sing at the end 
for now. Questions, comments, amplifications? There will be access to these slides because um, the, uh, the, the Big Bold Jewish Climate Fest is going to post every single one of these online, Lord have mercy. You can email me, uh, rabbifred at adatshalom.net. Uh, if, you, if you'd like me to email you a, an actual PPT, I'd be happy to. Um, Vicki, do you want to uh, scan and help lift up some of these? Um, building hope while working. I don't think I need to, to unmute anybody, do I? Positive action. Nice. Um, if you see a hand raised, we'll certainly take it. We are in the home stretch. It's an honor to be learning and oh, singing. Oh, yes, Stephen. Stephen. So, Steve, um, go ahead. Thank you so much, Rabbi Fred. I'm so impressed by what you've said and by all the initiatives that are going on in the United States of America. I'm in England, but I, I, it's wonderful to hear your wisdom and the wisdom of, of what's going on where you are. So I, I wish you great strength. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Nice. Thank you. Honored. Um, and they're, they're just scanning the names and faces, some of you who I have the honor of knowing or that Mirala does, and many of you that we're meeting for the first time, um, it's beautiful, the level of wisdom and depth that's just in one webinar and the reality that each one of us is like a microcosm, a fractal, and we can now take some of this Torah and spread it into our communities. Please, uh, Ruth Ellen. Let's see any other hands. Oh, yes, Ruth Ellen, you need to unmute yourself. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm unmuted. Yes. Thank you for putting up with me. I can't type in it fast enough. Uh, two things come to my mind. One in terms of uh, the idea of psychology and everything. What I would add to that now is the role of neuroscience, because what I find frustrating, and this kind of goes back to the analogy of the driver and the elephant, you know, all the neuroscience is saying that we act on autopilot. We work so much in the subconscious, and yet that's an evolutionary uh, met, uh, transition that's happened to help us survive and sustain ourselves with using minimal energy. So I keep coming back to the fact that we're all in our busy lives, and I, I love that we can meet and do everything like, you know, like this scientifically, but I mean, technologically, but a lot of the problems we've created is from going from an agrarian society where our communities are very small and localized and we always depended on that tribalness. When we went into industrialization and all that, that's kind of when the state and the need for all these social structures to you know, appear happen. And I always say also, I don't know that I wanna go back to being responsible for growing my own food and drawing my water from the well every day. You know, how can we find that balance? And, and then the second thing is with regard to Musar, I wrote that in there, um, empathy, empathy, empathy. Yes. And Rabbi, I love, you know, your Hillel quote. I keep going back to that over and over it because that is to me the nut of the, the easiest way to explain how we should live, you know, period. I mean, it, you have to take care of yourself, but you can't just take care of yourself. Now, to that right. point, my other third thing that's come right. up this, from this, but from all everything yeah. I've been watching is getting back, and the psychology can help with this too, getting beyond the short-term thinking to the long-term because the immediate yes. need to survival keeps us in the short-term. If we can't get people to think long-term and realize in the long-term, it's benefiting everybody, not just us, but ultimately it's the best way to for our mm -hmm. own personal yes. survival as well. So I don't know. Thank you. I'm yes, to no, th that it's a beautiful matrix of questions and, okay. and it overlaps with in the chat also Bertrand Russell saying, he, we are not the rational animal, we are the rationalizing animal. Our okay. brain is amazing. It is also limited. Um, and many evolutionary developments, both in the individual brain and in the what we might call human nature in the context of group relations, developed on the savanna, right? And it worked really well, uh, needing to hunt prey and protect our kids from the lions. Um, it, we are catching up very, very slowly, but we are catching up. And empathy is part of the innate human nature experience together with individual and small group uh, preservation. 
Um, the same psychology applies to innate bias and many of the vexing questions uh, around racial justice equity because um, we're trained to watch out for the people right around us who are going to look like us and question those further away. We now know there are insights that, that we need to undo that, but the stuff is deep. And that is where the commitment comes in, both the willingness to take that long view, long view for ourselves that we have grown over our lifetimes and will continue to, and long view over humanity. Whether it's the Iroquois Confederacy, think about the seventh generation impacts of your decision, or whether it's Torah, third and fourth generation in Exodus 34-7, uh, the thousandth generation, Notzer Chesed Alafim, God's time scale. Is, is theological time is geological time. It's not human time. And we need to make our contribution with zeal, with Ziri Zut right now, even as we take that long view. So thank you for adding all of that to the conversation. Um, Steve, please. Um, this, first of all, this is an absolutely brilliant session. I, I totally love it. And I second everything you just said. I just wanted to come back and reemphasize the importance of this integration between uh, Musar as the, you know, what David Jaffe calls the inside wisdom and uh, social activism, the outer wisdom. And you really can't have one without the other. It really doesn't work. And the reality is for those of us who have spent a lot of time in Jewish organizations, as I have, and I'm sure many people will understand and, and uh, identify with this, there's a lot of Jewish organizations whose mission is to do really great things, but the inside, the inner culture of those organizations is, let's say, less than perfect and less than less than humane. Uh, and just to comment and follow up on Ruth Ellen's point, uh, I think you know neuroscience is obviously helping us tremendously in these areas. But there's still you know what we're learning and what, what Rabbi Fred just emphasizes this notion of we can through ne neuroscience and other uh, techniques we're learning more and more about how we can surface some of those uh, innate or not innate, but habitual responses, make them bring them up to consciousness and then change them. Things like innate bias, et cetera, to become more aware of them, sensitive to them, and then through choice, you know, make, make changes. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, amen. And thank you. And that goes under Emmet, right? Just as we're open to climate science, we're open to developments in neuroscience and we need to apply them. And the best of the psychological research that, um, that Mirla is pointing us to um, is both looking at the, at the end result of, of more classical group studies of behavior, but also looking at the pathways that help condition us. The help condition is the important thing, right? Uh, Holocaust survivors like Viktor Frankl keep coming back to this idea that, that there is absolute evil and challenge in the world. And we have very limited power over most of it, but between stimulus and response, that space is freedom. That is free will, that is Musar. Right? We're not, it, Musar doesn't try to change that which is unchangeable. It doesn't bother to change that which doesn't need to change. Right? It's in that little space between stimulus and response where my Bechira point is, my choice point. Will I make the right choice today that will reflect well on the rest of creation, the rest of humanity, underprivileged populations, the global climate? right, et cetera, will I make that right choice right now? And uh, neuroscience is among many tools in the toolkit, as is Musar, um, that can help us get there. Um, and we're doing it together. So thank you. We are past the appointed hour. I want to end with one more slide because it's so easy to get complacent these days. This is a Kathy Wilcox cartoon. For anyone who may not be looking at their uh, screens at the moment, uh, and I apologize, this is very US specific. So to UK and Canada and Israel and elsewhere, um, this awaits. The uh, presumably dad is reading to the presumably daughter in bed, a book of fairy tales. And then there was a change of government and climate change just went away. Hooray. <laughs>
we still need zeal. We need zirizut, but we also need savlanut, patience, to be in it for the long haul. Every mida and its opposite. And as sunrise reminds us, to change everything, we need everyone. We're in this together. Thank you all. There are still a few more amazing sessions. So go back to the main website and enjoy and thank you. Look forward to uh, being in the work with all of you for a long time to come. And thank you again, Vicky, our Zoom guy. Rabbi, can I ask you something personally? I don't see why not. Just they have it. Everything you're saying. Th this is me personally. Uh, actually, sorry, oh. sorry, Vicky, you can stop recording. Sorry. Oh, okay. oh, okay. Blessing to everyone watching this after the fact. Oh, hang on.